Hi, this is Kimberly. This is a synopsis and a critique of Chapter 25 of the book Letters from Christopher, Tragic Confessions of the Watts Family Murders. This book is by Cheryl and Cato. The chapter is titled The Family. The chapter starts with Chris's parents and his sister finally being allowed to see him. If you remember from last video, I read a bit from the Greeley Tribune. I'm fairly sure I remember reading or hearing a report long ago when the case first happened that Chris did not want to see or talk to his family, but most especially his mother. I don't know where I heard this from, and I looked and looked for it, and I couldn't find it, so I gave the hell up. Let's just say it's gossip. The chapter says, quote, when Cindy went in to see Christopher, she asked him if he was sure he wanted to plead guilty. She says they yelled at her and said, quote, stop asking him those questions or we will shut this shit down right now, end quote. The Watts were confused about what was taking place and nothing was explained to them. Well, Shitface was their client, not them, so that's what I'm thinking. He probably didn't want them to give their opinion. The watch, she says, were still processing in their mind that Chris had put those precious innocent girls into the oil battery tanks. But Scribble says that is because of people who contact Cindy Watts. Let me just read this to you. Quote, However, because of people who contact Cindy saying there is evidence that Chris's first confession is his real confession, it confuses her and she still feels she doesn't know what to believe, end quote. Am I the only one that's noticed that Pinhead and his family are always confused? Why does she believe the first confession but none of the others? He pled guilty because he is guilty. Except that your son is a dumbass, nonsensical, homicidal dickhead, sissy piece of chicken shit murderer. Another typo sentence, quote, she promoted Thrive would make you feel you never had a day off, end quote. Yeah, I know there's typos in almost any book that is put out these days. It's because people have gotten lazy with spell and grammar check. Bella's name is also misspelled in this chapter, with an E on the end of her name instead of an A, so Bella instead of Bella. But Mrs. Scribble talks about all of the videos Shanann had online and how it was evident she liked nice and upscale things, and that Thrive promotes a life of materialism. She concedes that Shadam was good at selling and made sixty to $70,000 a year, plus her car allowance. I'm not sure where this income declaration came from. She doesn't say. She talks about how Shanann, quote, may have been materialistic, but was also driven and a natural salesperson. I remember from Dimwitz, Wisconsin interview, he said something along the lines of, Shanann could sell the shirt you were wearing back to you, and you would be happy about it and thank her. And in a letter that was read during the funeral, Frankie Russo described his older sister as an ambitious, outgoing woman who always wanted to be a mother. And no, that last part was not in the book. I just wanted to add that. Scribble goes on to say that Chris came from German descent and did not need anything beyond necessities. Well, no one needs anything beyond necessities, and some people like to work harder than others. Scribble says that all Chris ever wanted was for Shanann to be happy. Bullshit. He never told her no or argued with anything she wanted to buy or do. Horseshit. I think that had more to do with him being a pansy ass. But listen to this sentence. It really chaps my ass. Quote, However, the kindness and thoughtfulness he had for her was not reciprocated. End quote. First of all, how the fuck do you know this? Did Chris or Cindy tell you this? You could have at least said Nimrod claims blah 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 or Dickhead's mother said. Don't state this shit like it's fact. That the kindness and thoughtfulness was not reciprocated. I beg to differ. The first thing that comes to mind is when Shanann got Chris the Metallica concert tickets and t-shirt for his birthday. She could hardly contain her excitement. I'll post that video link in the description box below the video. I don't want to be hit with another copyright strike. Well, let's not forget Facebook posts she would do all the time praising his dumb ass.
yet Scribble says the kindness and thoughtfulness he had for her was not reciprocated. Another thought that comes to me is the shirt he was wearing when he gave the driveway interview claiming they were missing. One of the reporters commented that they liked it, and Chris went on and on about how Shanann got it for him, and it's his favorite college team, etc. Not to mention he wore that damn shirt three days in a row. I hope he washed it. So yes, Scribble claims in this chapter that Chris was not being shown kindness and thoughtfulness by Shanann and that it started to build inside of him. What about all those sappy Facebook posts she would do all the time praising his dumb ass? As I've said before, he should have spoken up. If he felt pent-up frustrations and scared of Shanann, so what does he do? wild and unbridled sex with N.K. He could have and should have gotten some damn mental health counseling for himself while his family was away for the summer. I mean, this is just a pea-brain bullshit excuse. He should have been practicing every day, saying, Shanann, stop, you're scaring me. So is this it? Is this the reason we're being offered as to why he had annihilated his family? Because according to him, Shanann didn't do kind and thoughtful things. That's a bunch of damn malarkey. Poor shit. What a wuss. For the first time in several, several chapters, Scribble seems to be writing this herself. Well, we'll see. She fooled my ass before. Chapter 24, was it? No, 23. This is 24. No, this is 25. Damn it. Good night, Kim. She begins with Bella talking about how Chris describes her as sweet and soft-spoken. Chris, according to Scribble, hears Bella's gentle voice every day. And then she goes on to talk about Bella's hair. Why do people talk about Bella's hair always? Scribble says that it was said by Cindy that Shadan's mom would cut it so it would grow back in thicker, but it was still baby fine. She also says that Cindy said it broke her heart to think about it because Bella wanted long hair, but it just would not grow long. I recall from the leaked chapters of Cindy Watt's book that Cindy insinuated that Bella was malnourished and that's why her hair wouldn't grow. Hell, all of my children were born bald. Their hair all grew in at different rates. My granddaughter was born bald and stayed bald for a long, long time. I know she was still pretty much bald on her second birthday. It took years for her hair to grow in, but it's long and luscious now. It's just that way with some kids. Bella was only four years old, and her hair was curly so it would kind of draw up. Mrs. Rusick said on the Dr. Phil show that when you pulled out her hair, say, to style it, it was actually kind of long. I would take anything that Cindy says about Shanann and the children with a grain of salt. This sentence in the book sickened me. Quote, it's heartbreaking her hair was caught on the hatch door as he pushed her little head through the eight-inch hole, end quote. That just made my stomach drop. If that sentence was meant for shock value, it did its damn job. And it was not necessary to word it that way to tell the story. Some people are so fucking uncouth. Why does Scribbles have to say these horrid things? I think she thinks it makes the book better. And that uh, it makes her look like a real professional writer? No. No, quite the opposite. But Scribble mentions the vision board that Shanann helped Bella with, and that Shanann was teaching her to be confident, smart, and beautiful on the inside. Cato then says this, quote, She had approval from her mom, something most girls long for, but never achieve, end quote. Wow. I find that to be very, very untrue. Most girls don't get approval from their mom. That's fucking absurd. Is this another research shows factoid bullshit malarkey? She mentions the song Bella sang about her witless daddy being a zero. I mean a hero. And then says, quote, If Christopher thinks of it now, how much it must hurt. Must? Did you ask him? I'm not sure he feels hurt or anything for that matter. I thought he was pretty much devoid of emotion. And it's his damn fault that Bella's not here to sing anymore. 
Scribble talks in the chapter about how the grandparents have suffered and the pain they must be in, and perhaps the media will leave them all alone soon and allow them to grieve privately. I don't think it's so much the media as a select few crazies that have come forward to harass and threaten them and say horrible things about Shanann. Then she goes back to Bella and how it seems as though she had some sort of sixth sense and talks about Bella being put into the truck that morning and how she must have been so scared, yet at the same time trusting her daddy and what she witnessed at Sir V319. And this became part of the book that I had to leave for a little bit and come back to it. The thought of what that sweet angel went through and saw, it almost physically sickens me. Then she goes on talking about Cece. She was fearless and thought of life as a party. She talks about her first trip to the beach and how Belle and Celeste were best friends. I do agree with that. They were always holding hands, playing, and kissing one another. Bella watched out for Cece, and Cece showed Bella how to step out of her comfort zone and have some fun. They were both so filled with light and joy. And then she says how the two of them held on to each other on the drive to the Survey 319. The girls had had their clothes picked out for school, and they were excited to start that day. Scribble says Shanann was having Christopher's boy. He would have someone to enjoy as he was growing up. Who, Pinhead? While Pinhead was growing up? That's who it sounds like, you were saying. The father-son bond he had had with his dad. However, that was not enough for him then, but now if you were to ask him, he grieves over that loss. Does he now? She says, there is so much more to this story that Christopher does not even know. Like what? What does that mean? What does it mean that there's more to the story that Chris does not know? That's the biggest statement in this chapter. Can she back it up? How do you know there is more? How do you know Chris doesn't know? For fuck's sake. Was she watching the Golden Girls while she was writing and forgot to put the rest of this in? She then ends this very short four-page chapter with, quote, They never got to tell their family goodbye as their bodies could not even been shown. The crude oil the girls were in and the extent of decomposition, the bodies of Shanann and the girls made it impossible to give them the usual funeral where the bodies could be shown, end quote. So I'll tell you what I found in relation to this, what Frank Rusick Sr. told Dr. Phil last March. In trigger warning, it's graphic in nature. Frank Sr. said, quote, The hardest thing was flying them here because they were in crude oil for four days, so they were flammable. So we couldn't cremate them. They would have blown up a building. They had to have a bigger coffin and then they had to seal it with a certain wrap so the gases wouldn't leak out. That's pretty sad, isn't it? So we three here never got to say goodbye to our family or see them, end quote. I can't show you that Dr. Phil interview because of copyright issues, but I will link the Daily Mail story from March 14, 2019, there are several clips of the Rusick interview with Dr. Phil on his YouTube channel that I'll link below. I was just getting into this chapter because, unlike all of the copying from Discovery, she seemed to use her own words for the most part. I wish she would have stated where this info came from. If it was from Chris Asshat Watts, or from Cindy Watts while she and Scribble were still talking, or what, although most of it was shit I already knew from watching Shanann's videos and news reports. She also added a whole lot of conjecture, plus a couple of sentences that just did not make any sense. And of course, the misspelling of Bella's name. And we still have three chapters to go, plus the epilogue. And no, I'm not going to quit this series until the book is finished. I'm also going to read a separate video. The letter that was written on behalf of Cindy Watts and given to Judge Kalkow. I thought it would be fun for you guys to hear that. And please forgive this video. I know it's not one of my best, but I have bronchitis and it just hangs on and hangs on. So I've edited out the wheezing and the coughing. <laughs> I do have antibiotics if uh, anyone is wondering. Powerful ones. 
And that will be the end of this video. I will pick up with chapter 26 in the next one. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening.